Tonight I want to look, of course, at the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, or in the King James, temperance. So before I get into it, it's important to acknowledge that we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. I've said this every time I've spoken, maybe Brenda said it when she was sharing some of the fruits, but this is not your own fruit or your own characteristics. These are characteristics of God that he desires to, that they would work our way out as we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. So with that in mind, when we're talking about self-control, understand that self-control is not being in better control of what you want to do, but what God wants to do. S the self, it is you, but it's not the old, selfish, dead you. The self in self-control is the new you that is created according to true righteousness and holiness and a lot of the things, the promises and the, and the truth of who we are in Christ that we've been studying for a whole year just about in the book of Ephesians. Who we truly are in Christ, that's the self that we're to have control of, not the old self. The old self, we don't just need control of him, he needs to die Okay, and so to not mince words. But the old self is to be crucified with Christ, and the new self is what's to live. Therefore, point number one that I want you to see tonight is self-control is really giving God control. Self-control can be examined in our life in the three main ways that make up what we call the outer man. As we want to, if you want to examine your fruit and see how you're doing in this area, how are you thinking? How are you speaking? And therefore, with those two, what are you doing? Those are the three areas we can look at within ourselves and see are we exhibiting the fruit of God, our thinking, our speaking, and our doing. As I mentioned, the word self control, originally translated in the King James Version as temperance, convey with it the idea of getting control over the flesh in the word temperance um, and fleshly desires. Here's a scripture that talks about this. 1 John 2 and 15. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Obviously, he can't be talking about the same sort of world that Jesus was talking about when he said, for God so loved the world, right? Because God loves the world. He meant the people. But what he's saying here is don't love the things in the world. The world. If anyone loves the world, he says, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So see, he who does the lust of the world, desiring to do what the world wants, is in opposition to the will of the Father, what the Father wants. Lust in this passage is talking about a, a desire, a craving, and a longing for things that the Father has said are forbidden. I know this is kind of archaic word, but it all goes back to the garden. I put you in this great world, but the Lord did say there's one thing that was forbidden, that was the fruit from the one tree, okay? Of that one tree, you're not to eat, okay? Um, tonight, I don't want to spend a little bit of time, not much. We're not going to read a lot of it, but as I was thinking about this, there's possibly no greater person or case study of someone going after their lusts and therefore facing the consequences of that than the judge in the book of Judges of Samson. Samson was a lust monster. Okay? I'm just going to give you a few snapshots into his life, but understand this about Samson. From the miraculous nature of his birth and all that took place with his parents, they said he was to be a Nazarite from birth. There was a high standard for him of what he was to live like. There was a high standard for him uh, of what he was allowed to eat and to drink, kind of like the cleanness of the Levitical priests. He was not to do certain things or, or be with certain people in order for him to be set apart unto God as a judge. And he knew all this. But let's look at a few verses about how Samson conducted his life. Judges 14 and 1. 
He just seems like a big baby in this passage. Just listen to this. Now Samson went down to Timnah, and he saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Of course, not his own people, the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah and the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. I, I want her. Then his father and mother said to him, Come on, Samson, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. This reminds me of my, a good friend of mine, Jeff, who's, um, we used to joke, but he, his mom, he was a mama's boy, and his mom would do anything for him, and he would sit on the couch when we were in like junior high, and, and maybe all the way up into ninth grade, we'd hang out at his house, and he'd go, Mama, I want a sandwich. And she'd say, you know where the kitchen is, make a sandwich. I definitely don't taste a sandwich. She, yeah, you're not going to until you get up in the kitchen. Sandwich, sandwich. And, he, and him and his mom, they played this game. You'd think she'd come over and smack him, but he was a big kid. And she was a short, she, I think she was only about five foot tall. But um, Mayor, Maryland. And, uh, and he'd just sit there and he'd do that for 15, 20 minutes straight. Sandwich. I'm definitely not tasting a sandwich. Nope, nope, there's no sandwich here. I'm not tasting. And finally his mom would come from the other room with a sandwich on a plate. He had he got to the point where she he just knew if he kept pestering her he'd get a sandwich. He's just a big baby, and here's here's Samson, get her for me. I just got done telling you, can't you find a better woman? I want her. You know she pleases me well. All he did was look at her. I want her. I want her now. Sandwich, give it to me. Samson was a flesh feeder. The lust of his eyes. He saw something. Verse nine in the same champ chapter. We know the story that as he was going about doing some stuff, he found some honey in the carcass of a lion, which was unclean. He wasn't supposed to be eating that. And he did. But in verse 9, it says he shared it with his folks. And he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. That wasn't just so that later on it would set the story up for him to give a riddle later on to the Philistines. That's not why. He didn't tell his folks because he wasn't supposed to be eating honey that came from a dead carcass that was forbidden for him and unclean. He was not to be eating that. So he lied to his parents because Samson was controlled and he was starting to learn how to be controlled by his appetites, by his desires for things. Skipping ahead to Judges 16.1. Interesting how the author here just puts it so plain. 16.1. Now Samson went to Gaza, saw a harlot there, in other words a prostitute, and he went into her. We know what that means when he went into her. Okay. This means that it got to a point now where Samson was completely unbridled, out of control. He just said, I'm going down to the, to the prostitute house. You know, and I'm going to go and do what I come to do. Not... She didn't, you know, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about that a, a, a young, uh, a youth that doesn't want to be controlled by lust, it says, should make a path far from the wayward wife's house. We used to talk about that in discipleship. If you know where there's a place where you're going to get tempted, go three blocks this way, three blocks this way, and three blocks that way to avoid that because first you walk by the door and you think you're good. And then they say hi. And then you want to be friendly because you're a Christian, so you say hi. Then they say, well, hey, would you step up in that? And then it, you never get into full-blown sin in step one. It's a slow fade, as Casting Crown Song said. It's a slow fade. You know, um, and that's true, but Samson had done already faded. He wasn't doing the slow fade. He went there and he went there and he went straight in and did what he had to do. Um, and then it says a little bit later in verse 16, And it came to pass when she pestered him daily and pressed him, this is when she's trying to find out about the secret of his hair, his soul was vexed to death. His soul, it got to the point where her words were, you know, he had lost the ability to distinguish good and evil. He was a full-blown lust person. He was a full-blown appetites person. And then verse 19, I found this quite interesting. This is right before he gets his head shaved. She lulls him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks. But notice this. And she began to torment him. She wasn't the one shaving the head. Somebody else was doing it. But when she was doing this, what she was doing, she began to torment him. 
in our vocabulary nowadays, when we think of torment, we think of the demonic. It's, you're at the point now where you're, the demonic has full influence into your life, and that was where Delilah had gotten herself to with Samson. She was tormenting him, and his strength left him. Lack of self-control will destroy your life. With Samson, he developed a habit for sin, an appetite and a taste for it, for the forbidden. Conversely, he lost wisdom and common sense. He was lulled to sleep both physically and spiritually. And as a result, his soul was vexed, he was oppressed, and he was overtaken. Christians who don't take the freedom from sin that God offers are playing on dangerous ground. Let's look at a quick New Testament scripture that puts it a little more so than uh, our seeker-friendly churches like to say very often. But And by the way, I want to be friendly towards people that are seeking God too. I want to have a friendly environment where you can come just as you are. But at some point, you have to tell people the truth. Hebrews 10 and 26 says, For if we sin willfully... After we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. God is full of mercy and grace, yes, and he loves the one that's seeking him and that wants to come to him. But notice in the first verse it says, after we received the knowledge of the truth. If you've received that knowledge, if you've received a degree of God's spirit and presence and favor in your life, but you continue the habits that we know are bad, whether that be food, drink, some sort of substances, what you allow into your ears and into your eyes, what the Bible calls gateways, your ear gates and your eye gates, what you think about, what you meditate on, what you talk about, what you focus on, if you allow those things to continue, when God has given you grace to be free, then you can't really at that point say, God, why would you let this come upon me? Because he didn't. He just as he didn't let Delilah come upon Samson. Samson let Delilah come upon Samson. In fact, I, you, we read the stories and kiddos can read that and be like, man, he's stupid. You know, hey, what will make, make the strength go away? Well, if you tie me with a twine bought at Menards, I'm, uh, for some reason, Menards twine always works. And you know, boom, he snaps it right off. I was kidding. It's the Home Depot. It's the Home Depot. If you use Home Depot string, be, and then snap, he snaps it again. I was kidding. It's Lowe's. It's actually Lowe's, you know. And then finally he tells her the truth. What is this guy, stupid? How would you tell her the truth? She done bound you by the way that you said it three times already. And now you're going to, but you know what? The answer to is he's stupid? Yes, he was. It's like a, a, it's like a buck in hunting season. They're stupid. They'll run right in front of you. And you're like, hey, I'm right here. And they're like, I don't care. Where, where's that doe? And then they're dead. Okay, so as Christians, we're not, to, we're not to do that. We're to exercise something called, a fruit of the Spirit, called self-control. Another word for self-control in this context is all of our favorite words that starts with the letter O. Obedience. Obedience. If Samson would have been obedient to the Lord... That would have been the fruit of self-control because he would have been saying, it's not what I want to do or what my flesh desires to do. It's what God wants for me to do. And if I'll do it God's way, there's a hedge of protection around me when I do that. I saw a Facebook quote recently. Somebody just put a little thing on Facebook that just said, the fruit of the Spirit grows only in the garden of obedience. It was uh, Melissa James that does the bounce back. She posted that up. And as I was preparing this, I saw that. And I said, I'm going to borrow that. The fruit of the Spirit grows only in the garden of obedience. Honey, I'm going to need you to run me my cell phone here real quick because I got a quote. I forgot this in my phone. On a recent Sunday night, we identified proper doctrine regarding salvation. 
grace through faith, and we talked about some things like that. Thank you so much. However, that does not save us from future consequences of what Hebrews that we just read calls willful sin. Whether that's an outward or an eternal consequence, you know, the fact that you're saved by grace through faith does not mean that there's no consequences if you willfully continue to sin on things that God has told you not to sin. Again, I mentioned substances and things like that. Hey, you know, if you are a Christian, but you just are still struggling with drinking and you're an alcoholic your whole life, and you end up with cirrhosis of the liver, that's a natural consequence of, of continuing to drink. Or maybe one that more str Christians struggle with than anything. If you will not change your diet and eat appropriately and end up with diabetes or this or that, that's not God. God's given us wisdom to understand, you know, what is good and what's bad. You don't want to know what's good? Brussels sprouts, they're good, okay? <laughs> you might not like them, but they're good. You know, you know, some other things that you might not like are probably good. I don't know. I'm not a nutrition expert, so I won't try to insert what I, you know, think is good. But, you know, I think my mom always did a pretty good job when we were kiddos. We didn't, we didn't have anything that sat on the shelf that was in a package. It was all made. You know, that's the way my mom did it. And I appreciate it now. At the time when I was a kid, I was like, oh, I want to go over to little Tommy's house. They got Fruit Loops. We got no Fruit Loops here. All we got is... Cornmeal mush. I don't like cornmeal mush. You know, well, that's what you're eating, kid. And we don't got no brown sugar or nothing to put on there either. Just the cornmeal and some butter, and that's about it for you. Now get in that corner or else you're getting no water. No, I'm just kidding. That's, my mom never said that. <laughs> my mom, uh, or I'm sorry, a pastor up in the Twin Cities one time was preaching. I don't know if Brenda would remember this. Uh, I think his name was David Pettiford. Um, and he was preaching at our church one time, and he was talking about consequences of our actions. And he was a kind of a large black gentleman, coach, football coach, real, you know, peppy sort of guy. And he said, don't tell me that you didn't know fat meat was greasy. <laughs> anyway, that may not resonate with you, but he was just saying, come on, you know, if you're eating fat meat, you know it's greasy. So, you know, when there's tons of sugar in everything we eat, and that's something... You know, there's consequences, if you will. I'm just getting back to this self-control. Doing things that are not because it's what you necessarily want to do, but it's because it's what's going to be the outcome that you're looking for, if I could say it that way. I, I want to read this short um, portion of a daily devotional that my friend Tommy had sent me last Wednesday as I was preparing this. If you guys were here on Wednesday, as you know, I kind of put this on the back burner and did, we did something different, Psalm 23 last Wednesday. So I had this. It was from a week ago. So give me one second. Let me find this. Um, there we go. Uh, it's yesterday. I got to go back. He does a little devotional each day. Once in a while, there'll be one that I'm like, man, that's perfect for what I'm talking about. Here it is. Calling living deliverance. This is, again, talking as God set us free from sin that we're not to continue in it. Self-control with sin. Living deliverance. Our Lord can deliver us out of anything, and he will if we ask. The problem comes with us living out his deliverance. He delivered Israel out of Egypt, but getting Egypt out of them was a different story. He delivered Israel from the enemies, but living out the victory was a different story. Jesus delivered people from spirits, but warned them sternly that if they didn't fill that void with the Holy Spirit, the spirits would come back worse than before. If you are delivered, you have to live it out your whole life, every day, claiming the Lord's victory, never believing the lie that you can go back to what you were delivered from. Because if your father, because if you falter, pardon me, if you falter, if you forget, you run the danger of walking back into what you were delivered from. Deliverance is a living thing. And I thought that was kind of fitting. So first, the fruit of self-control is really allowing God to have control. That's step one. Number two, secondly, with the fruit of self-control comes responsibility. 
because the word self in there. So God gives us a, a level of responsibility in this. Not only are we trying to have, let God have control, but we're responsible for that. And we're going to see it actually in the next couple points. But in this one here, Luke 12, 48 says this, For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So how many here have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? How many in here have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the gift of speaking in new tongues? How many in here have been given a lot by the, Holy, by the Lord, such as being born again, set free, sealed with the Holy Ghost, delivered? Well, if that's true, then we got a level of responsibility. Here's five words that are not allowed in a Christian's vocabulary. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. Those aren't allowed in a Christian's vocabulary when it comes to self-control, when it comes to doing the things that God's called us to do. Now, if we're just talking about something simple like uh, you want to go s skiing with me this weekend, you say, no, I don't feel like it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when God's called you to do something. I don't feel like it. Self-control means doing right in spite of how we feel. A scripture that you've probably heard a million times. I don't have the reference for it, but Pastor Steve used to use this on me all the time. Be instant, in season and out of season. Of course, I know it goes on. I believe that's to Timothy, if I remember correctly. Be ready, in season, out of season. Rebuke, reprove, exhort with all patience and long suffering. Carry out the work of a, of a preacher. Do what you got to do, you know. When you feel like it, that was his way of, of giving the... Uh, that was his uh, version, if you will. In, be instant in season and out of season. He says this, when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. That's when we're to do it. Living out a life that's honoring to God when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. I don't always feel like going to church. I don't always feel like praying in faith. Sometimes I just feel like saying, God, just send me home right now. I quit. I'm like, Elijah, put me underneath this tree and just kill me, Lord. You know, but that's not praying in faith. That's in the Bible to show me, in a sense, that, God, that we all can be relatable. But that's not in there to say that's what I'm to do. I'm not to be like you know, uh, Jonah or somebody that sticks himself under a broom tree and just wants to die. You know, I'm supposed to be who God's called me to be, instant, in season and out of season, when I feel like it and when I don't feel like it. And with God's help, it's not easy, but that's what self, part of what self-control is about, the responsibility. Number three, moving right along, but this kind of ties in together here. Self-control also encompasses knowing when and how to use spiritual giftings. See, God has a timing for everything. When he was on the earth, he, sh he did that. He did not just stop and heal necessarily every person that he saw, but as they encountered him, if they would cry out, he would stop. But, you know, we talk about the man at the gate called Beautiful. How many times did people pass him by until that specific day when Peter stopped and delivered uh, him with some healing? God has a timing for everything. God uses differing methods in different situations. Self-control encompasses part of this as a means of understanding this. How and when to use spiritual giftings. And I want to read a little portion of scripture here. 1 Corinthians 14 about these gifts. Starting in verse 26, Paul's writing and he says to the uh, Corinthian church, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm. Each of you has a teaching or has a tongue or has a revelation and has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. See, he's giving these instructions about how to work the spiritual gifts within a, a sanctuary, within the church. And let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. 
and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but the peace, and in all the churches of the saints. And then, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues. But this is the one that we usually quote, but let all things be done decently and in order. So I'm not teaching, I'm not going to get into these gifts tonight, but the fact that even spiritual and supernatural situations, we are still called to operate in the fruit of the Spirit of self-control. Okay? Even though it's the Spirit of God, that doesn't mean that we lose control of our faculties. Now, there may be some exceptions when something's going on and it's a corporate thing. I mean, if if a, there's a corporate being uh, falling over in the spirit or there's a corporate holy laughter or something that's going on. If you were back in the 60s or whenever it was when Kenneth Hagin was ministering and he would wave his hand and everybody would start laughing over here and then he'd laugh. And this, Whether or not you're, you're familiar with that or not, that was a corporate thing. He was leading from the pulpit that they could all operate in this gift of the spirit. It was not something where all of a sudden it was out of control, just one person back there kicking chairs around and falling over and we all had to stop because sister so-and-so back here just lost control. Um, the Holy Spirit, I don't know about you, but I was given the gift of tongues when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not overcome me, grab me by the ear, and make me speak in tongues in situations where it's not appropriate. He gave me that gift and what I do is I sense him, I feel the Holy Spirit moving upon me, and he leads and instructs me when it's an appropriate time and circumstance when I would pray and speak in tongues. Now, my personal prayer language, I can do that at any time. But again, if it's not to be interpreted in a church service, sometimes it's inappropriate just to bust out in a tongue and then act like anybody's supposed to get something from that. If there's no interpretation then we don't get anything from that. So again, I didn't mean to get into that, but the idea is, what I'm getting at here, is that the Lord give me a level of self-control. That, that's my gift, and that's all of our gifts. In, uh, the, the Bible says various types of tongues. Um, personal prayer language, so on and so forth. But here, here's another one within that same passage, verse 32 that I just read. It says this, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Have you ever thought about what that meant before? Well, I've heard it preached two ways, and I believe that both ways are valid. One of the ways is this, because it doesn't differentiate in the Greek, so to speak, where you'd be able to know. So one of the ways is this. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, meaning I still have control of my spirit. Even though God gives me a prophetic word, it's still within my control to open my mouth and to speak out his words. I can resist, for example. I could say, I could be fearful and say, I'm not going to speak his word. He doesn't force, he didn't force Jeremiah. He didn't force Isaiah. He said, who will go for me? And they said, here am I, send me. We have to still agree with God. And the, so that's part of it. And that also means that if it's not an appropriate time, I can't do something that's completely inappropriate and then say, well, God's the one that gave me the gift. It's still up to us to have self-control to use it. The other way that I believe is another valid way of interpreting that scripture is that because, remember, he said everyone comes with a prophecy. There was many people there that could be considered because they, they operated in the gift of prophecy. They could be considered a prophet. So the spirit of the prophets are are subject to the prophets goes with some other scriptures where it says, okay, let one person prophesy and then let the others kind of discern or categorize that. Brenda, you starting that music on me? Okay. <laughs> I think you're a little early, but that's fine. You go ahead and play it. I like preaching to music. You can keep playing. It's fine. Um, so in other words, that's where the Bible says, hey, don't treat prophecy with contempt. But when, you're, but when you hear a prophetic word, you're to examine it, hang on to that which is good, and discard that which is evil. I've thought about that scripture so many times. In other words, someone could prophesy, and as you discern it, you might say, no, that's not for me. Or that's, that, I, don't, I don't agree with what was just said. Is it possible that somebody could miss it when they're giving a word of prophecy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because otherwise the Lord wouldn't have said, hang on to that which is good and discard that which is evil. If we're all to... Did you turn the music off? Oh, okay. Oh, it's still on. Okay. 
I was like, it's so soft I couldn't hear it anymore. Turn it up a little bit so I can hear it a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm a picky preacher up here tonight, ain't I? Sorry. Sorry about that, Brenda. But anyway, so in other words, there's a, there's a certain degree where the Lord expects us and gives us responsibility to interact with the Holy Spirit as he gives us a word to examine it before it comes out of our mouth, make sure it's of God, and so on and so forth. So because there's spiritual gifts, that doesn't mean that we um, lose our ability to, um, to put that through the, the test, if you will, of the scriptures. For example, except on rare occasions, and even according to this passage that we just read, our messages to people are supposed to be uplifting, edifying, and for the building of people. Yes, there's rare occasions when there's a thus saith the Lord, if you don't turn, you burn. You know, but that's very rare. That is when the Lord would give like a message to a Jonah to go preach to a nation of Nineveh. If you don't turn back, God's going to bring destruction upon you. That's not normally what takes place in a church service. In a church service, according to Ephesians 4 and 29, it says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification or building up that it may impart grace to the hearers. If you're here at church today, God's called me not to break you down, but to build you up. Okay, now part of that process may involve having to get hurt in some areas because if there's something that's not of God, then, then we want that to go. We want that to be given up. We want that to be surrendered and, and given to God at the altar so that he can then come in and bring what he wants to bring. But, but still, God has called us not to use our gifts to go into as my brother, good friend, brother love, used to say, I don't believe in drive-by evangelism where you just go by and shoot them with the word of God and then say it's up to somebody else to solve the mess. We're to go by and to love them first. It's good news. It's not, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. I do not agree with people that just stand with signs that say, you're all going to hell. You're never going to win anybody with that way. The Bible says it's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. And in my opinion, the way to win people for Christ is to first let them know about the love of God. Self-control, I'm almost my final point here, but self-control is a characteristic of God because God is not shocked or surprised by circumstances. God is not a reactionary, knee-jerk reaction sort of God. As we say, of course, God is omniscient, but nothing surprises God. Nothing surprises God. He knows the end from the beginning. And so when he's working this fruit out in our life, number four is this. Self-control is calm and confident. Self-control is calm and confident. Self-control is not an emotional outburst. Self-control is calm and confident. God is calmly and confidently working his plan. When Jesus was on the way to go see um, uh, his friend Lazarus that had passed away, he was in no rush. He knew that he would be there at the right time, according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. His plan, of course, was to raise him from the dead. Everybody's like, why aren't you? Because God is not a God of a knee-jerk reaction. He's calm and he's confident. That's where the idea from this song comes from. Sometimes he calms the storm and other times he calms his child. God, sometimes he jumps and says, peace be still. And sometimes he says, don't be afraid. I know I see the wind. I see the waves just like you do. But I want you to be calm. I want you to be collected for a moment and I want you to operate in self-control. <clears throat> and God calls us to work with him. We know that from the helper that he gave us, that, that he's really called us to do the work, but he sent us his helper. So being reactionary can actually work against that. Emotions that are not under control can actually hinder God's work. We all have emotions. Jesus understands those, but we need to have them 
in a place of control. Great example of that. I have a lot of interest in stuff, um, you know, survival type stuff, military history, and just hunting and backpacking and anything that has to do with having to create a create a fire with you know a little bit of pocket lint and a paper clip and doing something like MacGyver. That interests me. Okay, I like that kind of stuff. They say this, that in an emergency or a survival situation, such as like a plane crash or a car crash out in the middle of nowhere, that the very first thing you must do is stay calm or to calm yourself. As I've read books about this, this topic of survival, there's countless examples where people made bad decisions because they didn't first calm themselves down. They panicked. There's a couple examples. I won't go into them deeply, but one of them has to do with, they say if you're at a crash site, you have to be very wise about whether you should ever leave that crash site. Some people are like, there's a crash, so they'll start walking, and they don't realize that five minutes later someone came to the smoke and was going to rescue them, but they're gone because they didn't get their wits about them. Or another one, sometimes they've said um, that people will go off in the wrong direction based on a hunch. Um, actually pilots they i forget what they call the word but pilots sometimes they won't trust the instruments on their panel and they'll feel like they're going down they're going down they're like but the panel says that they're going straight but they're like but i don't feel like i'm going straight and they'll pull up and the next thing you know they crash into a mountain or something because they didn't trust the instruments that were on the panel calming yourself using um, god's help and number three not getting priorities in order such as shelter, food, and, and water. Sometimes people will panic. They'll start walking off and stuff, but they don't have an idea what are they going to do when it gets cold? What are they going to do when they have no water or whatever? And so in an emergency situation, they always say, the first thing you got to do is get your senses about you. Calm yourself down. Breathe. <sighs> okay, what's going on here? Um, and it's the same way in spiritual situations. Um, certain emotions, such as that are real emotions. They, we all have them or have experienced them, but fear, anger, um, feelings of sorrow or despair um, are not necessarily going to help in a spiritual still situation. While still maintaining love and compassion, reports of sickness, for example, should not shock us. Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. We have been in a season where there's been a lot of sickness. And it can get to where you feel like you're getting attacked on all sides, you know. Um, and if you're part of the prayer chain or someone that's attuned to the different needs that are out there, it's like, man, every single day there's another report, another report. If you allow that to, that can get to where you're an emotional wreck. Because of this, we have to slow down and say, hold on a minute. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. That's how Paul could say stuff like, whether I live or die, God's going to get the glory, essentially. That's a paraphrase. But for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, I've run my race. You know, he was never moved by the idea that he was going to pass from this world one day. He was instead um, basing everything upon a calm and a controlled understanding of what God was going to do in his life. Instead of allowing that to, to happen, we got to lovingly face the situation, whatever it might be, with the truth of God's word and utilize self-control. I mentioned this last Wednesday when I was doing Psalm 23. When you hear someone's backslidden in their addiction, instead of having an emotional response of anger that'll distract you or, or despair and saying, they just are never going to get it, and just doing that, which will derail us. Instead, we can go into prayer and say, I'm calling the prodigal home. We can let loose God's ministering angels. We can ask the Holy Spirit, draw them back to you, Lord Jesus. We can ask God, God, give them divine appointments with other believers. But if you're not operating in the fruit of self-control, panic can set in and you forget all about these tools that you have, these spiritual tools that can actually do something about the situation. Instead, you can be full of emotion and whatever that might be, despair, panic, you know, um, anger or whatever. Fear is another big one. And instead, you don't get anything accomplished.
So God has given us this fruit of the Spirit, self-control. I'm hoping that we all can see the value of this fruit, that we realize when stuff comes against us, it's not the person, it's the enemy of our soul. The devil is after us. When we're in a place where we're out of control, it's a place where the lusts of the flesh are enticing us. It's a place where the fears of this present age are bombarding us. And it's always this thing. It's always this person. It's always something that's here in this world. But in reality, it's the devil. It's the enemy of our soul who's going after us. And the truth is, when we calm ourselves and when we collect ourselves, we remember the devil has no authority in my life. The devil really has no authority in my life at all. And therefore, often our most effective enemy is not the devil at all. It's our own flesh when it's out of control. Sometimes our worst enemy is us in a state of being out of control. When we're not walking in obedience, when we're not utilizing God's wisdom, or allowing our emotions to get out of balance, our own self out of control can sometimes be the most, and I'm not saying the only, I'm saying the most effective enemy. Because the truth is, when we're convinced about something, and we think about that, and we talk about that, and we're doing that, you'll get that. That's a, You're going to get just what you've been thinking about, talking about. So we have to get ourselves under control, but not just in the old self. we got to get ourselves under control, under obedience to God and what he says. I think of this quote, we've probably all heard it, but I'd like to, you to think of this tonight from a spiritual perspective as well as a practical. How many have heard this quote? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right? Right? In other words, instead of waiting till we get to a place where something that seems so, so big is actually not as big as we realized if we could get it back in the perspective of where God wants us to put it. Under his sovereignty, under our authority that he provided for us, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Lanny does one thing that I really like that I've always done, but he does it every single time he does a Sunday school class. Brother Lanny, he always does this thing where he goes, <sighs> this little breathing thing. But I learned that years and years ago. <clears throat> the gentleman that led me to the baptism in the Holy Spirit, Dave Howard, good brother that I got to know, did a Bible study for us. And whenever we would get to a part where there was something really sticky or hard to deal with or hard to explain in the Scripture, he did what, he never told me this, but what I coined later a spirit check. He'd do this thing where he'd close his eyes, and it would be awkward. When you're a new believer, you're watching this guy, you're watching his every move, trying to learn about Jesus. And all of a sudden, he'd close his eyes, and he'd go, and I'm only going to do it half as fast, because he'd take his time. he just, and we'd all be sitting there like, what is this guy doing? But then he'd open up his eyes, and he'd have a pearl of wisdom or he'd have something that would diffuse a situation. And later on, as I thought back on that, I said, you know what he did? He did a spirit check. He said, okay, I see the problem. I see this person that's instigating. I see this disease. I see this sinner. I see this pr whatever it might be. But you know what? There's an underlying problem that I'm, if I don't take a moment, calm myself before the Lord, Remember what his word says and come from this, come at this from a place of scripture, from a place of confidence in who I am. I'll miss it and I'll make myself a part of the problem instead of a part of the solution. And God's called us with the help of the Holy Spirit to be a part of the solution. And that's what the fruit of self-control is all about. Because really, is it, it's not just all about us, is it? Our life is about serving and helping others. And so we've got to be the ones, especially when we're in the room with all the people that don't know Jesus, that are not as frantic as the unbelieving, but are the ones that can bring 
some calm to the situation and say, all right, calm down. Let's just take a minute. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray for a minute. Or something. Bring a spiritual discipline, if you will, or solution to a crazy situation. I want to close by reading Galatians 5 again. This is our last night for now. We're going to talk more about the fruit of the Spirit, I'm sure, um, in our Christian lives. This ain't the last time you'll hear of it. But <laughs> but in this series, Galatians 5 and 22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things, against such, there is no law. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? I want to pray.